Welcome to Free Media, Free Minds, the show where we talk everything media. I'm Haldi Anson. And I am Pumeza Mtegazi. In this episode of Free Media, Free Minds, we ask, how does the media portray the role of the artists and musicians in our society? In South Africa, our arts and culture policy has, has its revolutionary feet firmly in the anti-apartheid movement of the 1980s. In fact, it was the then banned ANC who resolved that artists and cultural workers have a real responsibility to help build a non-racial, non-sexist society. 2013. How have artists and cultural workers interpreted this responsibility? Have they in fact contributed? But more importantly, how has the media interpreted their role in our society? In studio today, we have a group of artists and cultural workers who've come through to help talk this through. Welcome to Andre Marais, poet and cultural worker. Thank you for joining us. Mansoor Jaffa, editor whom we know as a journalist in our communities, also a founding member of the Cape Cultural Collective. Thank you. And next to him, we have Celeste Mitchell, who works in radio and is also part of the hip-hop <coughs> industry. And next to her, we have Biko Mutswarwa, who is from Sounds of the South. And at the end, we have Adrian Different van Veik, who is part of NZINC Poetry Sessions. Welcome. A warm welcome to our guests, and thank you once again to you for joining us. Before we talk all things media, let's go to a clip. We're going to be watching Crystal Williams, an incredible performer from the incredible Poetry Collective. Don't go away. When my lappen wordt vast gekramd door die man met die fancy titel op sy expensive bank. Maar wat as ek so skinner? Oor die antieke maniere met die reksies van leerders, langer as die top leerders sy trane in die kliniek spreek kame. Of oor die uitdeemse winkelbaas met meer boom verkoop as wat sy honger verwichte kaste me kan klim wat by die school afloop. Of wat as ek so skree? Oor tekstie drijvers met amper soveel sitplekke gevul die losvrouwens as die sy kinders in lijn van my dela geel. Nou wat as ek iets sal sê van die dinge? Dinge wat my oor laat brand en in my siel vloei soos kringe. Sal die dinge verander van my kinders? Maar ek haat die klank van my eie stem en hoe dit ek al van my tong tot my verhemelte. Powerful stuff. Mansoor, I want to start with you. In our country, music, the arts, has always played an important role in reflecting our identity and perhaps also the political um, landscape um, 20, 30 years ago, even for, you know, you're older than what we are, so you would understand that. But tell us, what, what do you believe is the role? Is this just because of apartheid that people felt they needed to reflect this? Or is this the role of the arts in every society? Essentially, these are very complex questions. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at history uh, of societies and struggles, you'd find that culture has always played a critical role in various ways. It's sometimes been used to oppress people. Uh, for example, assimilating their cultures, uh, repressing their languages. Um, like I've just been over to Turkey now where the Kurdish language has been <coughs> repressed uh, for almost 100 years since the breakup of the Ottoman Empire, but in many cases it's also uh, kind of been the fire and the drive for many movements and societies. Like in the time of slavery in America, it was the spiritual songs, the gospel music, uh, that you know made people cope in a very, very difficult period. Later on during segregation, it was the blues, and uh, you can go through many societies, poets during the struggle against dictatorship in, in um, Spain during the Franco era. There were was poets who inspired people. And in South Africa, we, we have many, many examples of music, art, and poetry playing a role in, in struggle and in the processes of, uh, of change. Mm. And I don't know if you want me to give examples please of that. Please do, please. Um, but, uh, you know, we had... Uh, Mary Makeba, Dalla Brand, uh, Yuma Sakela, people who took the anti-apartheid struggle abroad and introduced it to, to the international community. In South Africa, uh, I was just telling Andre earlier that maybe half of the time in a meeting was taken up in song. Mm -hmm. So um, when the meeting has started, people start singing. When the speaker gets introduced, people start singing. When the speaker's halfway, people sing. <laughs> 
And so maybe that delayed our struggle a bit because of all the singing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but we, are, we, we are a musical nation. But essentially, yeah. it did fire people, I think, when, when they started to toy toy and to sing about Oliver Tambo and Robert Sabukwe and Steve Biko. I think it, uh, it provided uh, a kind of impetus for people yeah. uh, and, and, a, and a momentum uh, going forward. So yeah, that's all uh, I want to say at this at this point. Yeah. yeah. Andre, just following up from what uh, Mansoor has, has been been talking about, what have been your um, experiences of art during the uh, the anti-apartheid struggle? Okay. Well, um, it was really much uh, my entry into anti-apartheid or politics was really much through art and. Uh, yeah, it played a, a very important role in mobilizing people and giving expression uh, to the political ideas of that time. I think um, uh, I, I was just uh, reflecting with Mansoor uh, earlier on about how, you know, how um, many of these of these gatherings. Uh, you might not sometimes re re remember the speeches, but you do remember the songs and the music and the poetry. You know, a uh, Sandiri de Kenny, who, who had a very famous poem called Guava Juice, and this was a this was a very popular poem that was called called uh, people requested you know Sandiri to come and perform this thing. So, so definitely, you know, it, it played a, a very important role in in our struggle, and sometimes. And underappreciated at all, you know that. That I, I think that uh, poets and writers and jazz musicians, uh, uh, just an example of it that I'll talk about a little bit later, are sometimes not under appreciated you know, for their contribution, you know, to that struggle. You know? And yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, Biko and Celeste, um, I'm sure you you work a lot with the youth. Like for you, Celestia, you work on radio, you work with the hip hop, and you have um, you you busy on, on social networks. Can you tell us what's the power of an individual expressing themselves through music and art? Well, um, this is something that I've been having kind of an issue with for a very very long time because specifically in the hip hop industry, um, most of the new artists don't understand the power of their words and the influence that they have on the people who listen to them. Kids remember the lyrics to every single song that they like. Any rap song that they like, they remember the lyrics, but they don't remember their homework. They don't remember their schoolwork. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of power that these artists have, and that's something that they don't understand. Um, the music today, compared to earlier days where hip hop started as a culture and a voice first, has now evolved into um, something that perpetuates the ills in society instead of you know, assisting to make things better. I think that's the struggle we face today, where artists don't understand the true power of their words and their social responsibility to spread a positive message instead of the messages they're spreading right now. Okay, without cutting you off or getting into what you're saying, um, um, Adrian, um, she mentioned something about power of words. Yeah. Can you tell us more about the importance of the language and, and representation of music in art? Well, to, just to elaborate on um, Celeste's point, there's a, there's a, there is that gap between, you know, schoolwork uh, in, the, in the education system at the moment, there's a gap between schoolwork and, you know, making, making uh, work exciting and enticing for learners. And that's the type of work we do. We go into schools and we, we, we fuse and we, we blur the lines between poetry and, you know, traditional poetry and we show that even a rap song, that's poetry. So I mean, um, the, the and the social role, especially, that that is your your responsibility as an artist. Let's take a very interesting look at this insert by Kate Alice and Balisa Sela from the Ink Incredible Poets. The truth hurts, they say. Name, they take your voice away. Try and shove you in a box that they're able to figure you out. Having freedom is not really for the smart. It is actually for the dumb copies who think they are free. Yeah. And for that, give thanks, Mandela, right? Wrong. Give thanks to your stupidity. Give thanks to that blindfold that you used to try and avoid that I am free and I just walk down. And please give thanks to that womb that filled you with promises of being born into a free and dumb country. 
country. Yeah. And give thanks to that light you saw when you were born and you thought freedom here I come. Yeah. But I'm afraid to be the one to tell you that light you saw was from the dome ships of Kayamani burning down. Make noise and talk about all the shit the world wants quiet. Try it. Ladies, you will not be grateful that your man doesn't beat you. But you will be outraged by the ladies' boyfriends who do. There is no justification when open communication is replaced by abuse, no excuse. The awful cliche of women being beaten down is locked in silence. And being passive about it is a form of compliance. We can break the cycle of physical violence if it can just be brought to light, if people can be taught to fight fairly. Make the support and be the connection. Don't be silent in femicide. We are in charge. We decide. There, we've, just, we've seen a piece by Kate Ellis from the InSync Poetry Collection, truly really powerful things. Um, Biko. Yes, Biko from Sounds of the South. Yes. Now, can you, can you tell us about the work that Sounds of the South does and a little bit more of why and how it started? Okay. Um, Sounds of the South is a collective um, of uh, cultural activists who take a political stance with regards to how they perceive poetry, graffiti, and all these other art forms. Because we believe that uh, the dominant ideas in any historical era are the ideas of the ruling class. Mm -hmm. So in our perspective, there is no such thing as uh, neutral art. And we don't think that an artist has the luxury mm -hmm. to say, I'm standing out of the struggle, I'm going to present a personal view. You're either in uh, uh, the, the, uh, your work for, to support the status quo or you are against. Now as Sounds of the South, we stand against mm -hmm. the establishment, yes. Mansur, you also come from a collective of, of, of cultural workers. What, do you, what, do you, what is your response to the rationale that Biko gives for why artists have to do the work they do? Yeah, look, I think uh, there's merit in the view that uh, the powerful classes basically determine the narrative and the discourses in the society. But I don't think that's the only um, analysis that, uh, that one should have. Because I think these uh, narratives, uh, the way people make meaning, it's also um, the product of kind of hundreds of years of systems, social systems, political systems, cultural systems. So it's not necessarily a case that there's a group out there imposing a particular viewpoint on society. Uh, we need to look at how history has brought us to where we are. And then... Um, the role of the cultural worker is then to say that we will uh, also create new meaning in society yeah. of the way we see things, uh, the way we understand things, and so on and so forth. Because we don't reflect uh, what we see in society through media and through culture. Uh, we construct uh, meaning all the time. And that's an important uh, difference. Uh, you spoke earlier about cultural workers reflecting what's out there but we don't necessarily reflect what, uh, what's out there. We, we construct meaning all the time. So just as those who are powerful are able to uh, impose their particular view of society, I think those of us in communities and in activism can also counter that with mm. different forms of meaning all the time. So there's always that possibility. So Les, you come, you work in both the commercial and in the alternative media sector. Do you think that the media is reflecting um, some of the, the elements that Mansour picked up, about, picked up on, um, issues about, about talking about the ills of society, constructing a new meaning. Is this what the media is doing? Do they reflect your work? Um, well, it depends on what kind of media you're talking about. Because you get the commercialized media and you obviously get the free media. Um, I think we in the commercial sense of media is, you know, they're obviously pushing an agenda. And what their agenda is, that's what they push, that's what they focus on, and that's also What are they pushing? Spell it out. Well, with the money, is that's where, that's where people go, you know. Um, whatever the agenda is of the powers that be and the people who hold the power, that's what they're going to push. Like, um, personally, I firmly believe that's what's happening with our artists today, and that's why a lot of our artists are struggling, because there are a certain group of artists who push exactly the agenda they want, and I feel that's to dumb down our society, basically. That's the direction we're heading in now, is where they're trying to dumb down the youth through hip hop, and that's the kind of hip hop that's get, that, Give an that gets pushed. Give example of dumbing down. Um, 
every single artist coming out of the States right now. They're not saying anything intelligent to the youth. So that's just my personal opinion, you know. There's no intelligent messages being spread anymore. Like, the history of hip-hop, it's the voice of the people, the Black Panther movement, the voice of the struggle. People were spreading a message. Now, it's all ignorance that they're spreading, where they're perpetuating things that are negative and putting it in a positive light, like incarceration, for instance. Today, everybody thinks it's so cool to go to jail. And that's because of the way the media and the music has been portrayed through the media. Yeah. So people think it's cool. And we as the free media, though, sorry, just one second. Yeah. Free media, um, I think, has more freedom to touch on the truth yeah. behind it. Adrian, I, mean, I can see you wanting to jump <laughs> in. Yeah, like, definitely, but um, come on, so it's not the everyone from the States. Just like, there, there are some conscious No, guys, but uh, no, th that's what I'm saying. But yeah. the conscious people don't get yeah, the shine in the media. I mean, the conscious people don't get... Um, pushed in the media, the media yeah. only pushes the dumbed down version True. of what's coming out. Yeah, yeah. Only if you love it, then you'll find that conscious element of hip hop, you know. But I mean, and it's especially dangerous in a, in a sense, I mean, America has mass media, you know, they, they've mastered it. <coughs> and then we have gangs like on the Cape Flats, we're struggling with gangsterism because of that problem of incarceration, mm -hmm. making negativity cool. It, and it, it is, it's a problem that we, and we see it, I see it every day with, in the workshops where, I mean, a young kid calls me, yo, nigga, what's up, man? Yeah. <laughs> Just because he watches hip hop and, the, and uh, watches hip hop music videos. Yeah. So it's, it's, a, it's a problem that we especially struggling with in Cape Town. Andre, you, also, you come from the alternative media sector, Amandla mm -hmm. Media. How does your media try to portray more positive images um, around? Um, a popular youth culture like um, hip hop and rap. Yeah, look, I mean, I just want to, before I answer that, I yeah. think um, I think what Silist is saying that uh, that they've managed to sell the worst of ourselves back to ourselves, you know, and because they run the the, the organs of the of the society, mm. you know, they're able to do that commercially with a profit and. And that is a real problem, eh? But it goes around who controls you know, these things. Now, look, now where I work, and the, I mean, I work in essentially poetry, printed the, the printed word. I think you know we we face you know, the same ch challenges, all right? Uh, uh, that uh, there's uh, very few platforms for us. Uh, there's very few outlets you know, for alternative thinking, for, for saying something interesting and and. Uh, insightful about mm. the society. So they said they said dumping down generally, I think, in culture, you know, but it's all about control and about who uh, who benefits and who profits, you know. So it it's not only in hip hop, it's in the printed word, it's in it's in jazz, you know, and and a, a, along and with that a terrible amnesia, a, a conscious thing of not Wanting to remember what had gone, what had come before, you know, and uh, you know, it creates a, an amnesia around what was. Give what an was example powerful. of his amnesia. Okay, um, for instance, I mean, if I could just uh, uh, this coming week, uh, I'm going to be uh, having a book launch around a, a jazz musician by the name of Chris McGregor. How many people know about Chris McGregor in Cape Town? Virtually nobody, or in South Africa. Tell us, you know, he's, uh, he's one you know, of the greatest kind of South African jazz pioneers uh, in the 60s and the 70s. And uh, uh, that's why you know, this book you know, that's, that was written by his partner, uh, Maxim, Chris McGregor passed away in 1991, so he's not a lot around you know, in a, any, any longer, but uh, this was a, was a very powerful moment and example of a, uh, a, a jazz pianist who had formed a, a series of uh, non-racial jazz outfits, you know, that's virtually unknown. Nobody knows about them, you know. We know about the Abdullah Ibrahims and the late Sir Satima Benjamin, but very few people know about that it's actually a lot of people just fall through the cracks in our memories and things like that. So I think, you know, so uh, long, you know, with selling the worst back to ourselves, there's also a conscious, conscious effort to, to uh, let us forget about things, you know, and, and, and it's partly our fault you know, as well. Yeah. 
I want to touch on that. Or not wanting yeah. to to inquire and you know and and, and wanting to. But no things. So yeah. Sorry, quickly, Andre, just to touch on that. I don't think it's it's our fault in a sense. Um, there's no platform or there's no education on that part. Um, the youth of today are not educated enough on those kind of things that Andre said now. But whose responsibility is it to do the education? It's our own, exactly. We have yeah. to create our own platforms. Yeah. We have to, I mean, we, we can't wait around and wait for these conversations to happen. Yeah. We have to start having these yeah. conversations. And this discourse needs to happen now. Um, we can't, we, you know, if we just lack it days, you go all the time sitting back and waiting for someone else to do it. I mean, that, that, no, nothing's going to get done right there. That, that's, uh, that's slacktivists. We should start being activists. Pico? Yeah, I, I, I connect it to what I said before. I think uh, I disagree with my brother. There is a set of people that we can even call out that are out there uh, working at design to ensure that revolutionary counterculture that is being created by the working class people in the course of their struggle does not get to be heard. These people control the, the radio stations. They control uh, the major television stations, the newspapers. The people that work there are told what to push out by the people who own it. It's not just dumbing down. I mean, maybe because we're in South Africa and, you know, uh, it, we have a bit of democratic rights there. But when you go to places like Zimbabwe, you can see the design of the system quite clearly. Like, there are artists commissioned by a government mm. to push out specific messages of depoliticization of young people. Uh, the party mentality that you also find with house music is part of this design to uh, sell alcohol, cigarettes, get young people drunk, and inactive in their communities. I think this is a deliberate design. And what uh, Chris McGregor and, and uh, people, that, uh, comrades around that time were doing was they were creating a counter couch. Okay. Now, to connect with that is what the system doesn't want. So that hence they create this amnesia. It's a deliberate designed amnesia. Thank you. Mansoor, I want you just to, to come in here. Um, Biko talks about a counterculture and that there's a deliberate attempt and that artists are his master's voice in a sense. Um, is this, in the, in the work that, that the Cape Culture Collective does, um, you, you know, you have the, you come with a legacy of, of, of the kind of work that cultural activists do, but you're also living in a new time. How do you balance the two so that you don't become um, reflective of, you know, progressive ideas all the time and the politics of the day. Yeah, look, uh, I'm sure Biko and I would need to have a discussion around uh, uh, some of these issues. I don't necessarily disagree with uh, the analysis, but what I'm trying to say is that there are some deeper issues at play as well in terms of how meaning is made, how it's been constructed over centuries and so on and so forth. So it's not always a group of people out there who decide, you know, this is what they want to do to us. And in any case, we have agency as well. Uh, we've always believed that through the darkest days of apartheid when we were in prison and on the run, that, you know, uh, the question of change lies within our capacity, within our power, uh, and within our capabilities. Mm -hmm. So while there is the issue of, you know, uh, control, there's also the issue of agency, which we need to now look at. Because yeah. the people, if we argue that there are people who want to control us, they're not going to change, if that's what we argue. Yeah. But we have to bring about the necessary change. And so through the Cape Cultural Collective, we have a number of uh, anti-apartheid activists of the past, um, and some young people as well who have come together around particular value systems, which is rooted in our history which uh, comes from the Freedom Charter in 1955, which says South Africa belongs to all who live in it, who speaks about the sharing of the wealth of the country, the doors of learning and culture being opened. And some of these things are reflected within our new constitution, but they're not always actualized in practice. And so as cultural workers, we want to play a role in doing that. And we do that through poetry. We have a group of people who are going over to Paris on Sunday to represent Cape Town in South Africa through a poetry production called Uhadi, which is the bow. 
and they're going to the Paris Autumn Festival. Yeah. And then we have a choir called the Rosa Choir, which is a non-racial, diverse choir, which sings in three languages. So it breaks down those cultural barriers between people, because like it or not, we still have the spatial <coughs> uh, arrangements that we had under apartheid and colonialism, in fact, where people of different racial categories live spatially separately from each yeah. other, largely. And so through the choir, we break that down, and we break down prejudices as well that people may have had. So we have gospel singers, Malay choir veterans, a marathon runner, university professor, and so on, all singing together in one choir in three languages. Mansoor, I'm going to have to, to stop you there. The work of the Cape Cultural Collective indeed sounds very interesting. Um, uh, we have to wrap up now, but I, as you can see from the level of the discussion that we've had here today, it is in, indeed a contentious issue. Um, it is indeed a, a long debate about the responsibility which cultural workers do have. But I want to leave you with a thought, and it's something which Adrian touched on. Part of the work of cultural workers is not only um, the responsibility of cultural workers, is not theirs alone. It's also mine, it's also yours. It's about inviting them into our communities to perform. It's about ensuring they have space on alternative and free media to express themselves, not to wait for the commercial media to give them a spot. More, most importantly, it's about imitating, replicating the kind of work that they do and not waiting for the message to come from outside. You're watching and you've watched Free Media, Free Minds. Thank you for joining us. I'm Helga Janssen. And I'm Fumas Amtegazi. Till we meet again on Free Media, Free, free Minds. minds. I am ready. We are here. Open to the